Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you today for our conversation with Congressman Dick Gephardt on politics, policy, and our civic responsibility. We have close to 200 people and a number continuing to grow from across the nation who have joined us for this discussion. Whether you are coming to this event through your connection with Washington University, through your connection with Congressman Gephardt during over 50 years of his career, or simply because you are interested in the topics we'll explore today, we welcome you and we're glad you're here. My name is Stephanie Kurtzman and I'm honored to serve as director of the Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement at Washington University in St. Louis. The Gephardt Institute was founded 15 years ago thanks to Congressman Gephardt's generosity and vision to invest in future generations of, of civic leaders, citizens, change agents, and stewards of our democracy. In June of 2005, when the Gephardt Institute was on the eve of our launch, we could not possibly have imagined where our nation would be in June of 2020. We did not know that 15 years after our founding, we'd be living through a devastating public health pandemic or that the pandemic of racism would swell and the movement for black lives would rise to new heights of awareness and social change in the midst of COVID. We could not imagine the economic fallout we're experiencing nor perhaps the extent of polarization and vitriol driving our politics. We could not have anticipated a decennial census and a historical presidential election unfolding behind face masks, social distancing, and court battles over voter access and election policy. We did not know that in 2020, we'd be writing a dramatic new chapter in America's history book about a time when our nation was tested in such profound ways. And yet, even in 2005, Congressman Gephardt knew that our nation would need citizens. He did not know what challenges would come our way, and yet he knew that we would need people who are actively engaged in our democracy and in civic life. He did not know how our leaders in government, industry, education, and social services would be tested. And yet he knew that we would need to invest in the next generation of civic leaders. He did not know exactly what those leaders would face or will face in the future. And yet he knew they would need to have a strong ethical compass, humility, empathy, the ability to listen and work across difference and steadfast dedication to making life better for the people in our communities. He did not know what 2020 would bring, and yet he knew that citizen participation, civic engagement, would be essential to moving us through these monumental challenges to become a nation that is more equitable, just, safe, and humane. Congressman Gephardt knew that democracy is not a spectator sport. He knew, as we all know, that our democracy is imperfect. He knew that our democracy is fragile. He knew that democracies can fail. Without knowing how history would unfold, he placed his bets on civic engagement, on ordinary people who get involved in their communities, who communicate with elected officials or become elected officials, who donate their time and money to vital causes, who dialogue, dissent, write better policy and vote. He placed his bets on higher education, on the importance of preparing young people for their civic responsibilities, on teaching future generations how to engage in the process of democracy. We are so grateful that Congressman Gephardt placed his bet on civic engagement by founding the Gephardt Institute. We are a nonpartisan university-wide initiative carrying out this vision among our undergraduate and graduate students faculty, staff, and alumni. Our work starts on campus and in our home community of St. Louis. And if we do our jobs right, the outcome of our work is seen and felt in communities around the world through our alumni who understand their inherent obligation to actively engage in making our nation and our world safe, peaceful, just, and equitable for all. 
Today, we commemorate Juneteenth across our nation to celebrate the ending of slavery as we knew it in 1865. I suspect that one thing that unites the numerous people attending this discussion is that we know we have tremendous work to do before everyone in our nation is truly free and before everyone in our nation can truly partake in the promise of democracy. As we move into our discussion, I invite you to reflect on the role you play and the role you can play in advancing this elusive promise of democracy. It's now my pleasure to introduce Teresa Quo, our Assistant Director for Civic Engagement Education, who will briefly tell you about our Engaged Democracy Initiative and introduce our moderator. Thank you, Stephanie. Welcome, everyone. Um, before I share more about our Engaged Democracy Initiative and introduce our moderator today, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, so just so everyone is aware, you all are muted and off camera, so no need to worry about uh, that. Um, Throughout the conversation, we encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A function below, located in the bottom panel. If you can't see it, just hover your cursor over the screen and it should appear. Questions can be for the panelists or other questions related to the Gephardt Institute. As a participant, if you see a question you would also like addressed, you can upvote the question by clicking the thumbs up next to that question. The more a question is upvoted, the higher it will move on the list. And so when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll start with the questions at the top of that list. For any questions that can be answered via text, our staff will respond as we can. Um, in the spirit of civil dialogue, we do reserve the right to dismiss questions that are hateful or inappropriate in nature, but we know that this audience will not do that. Um, but we know what you will do is encourage challenging questions, um, which we hope to answer today. We are providing closed captioning today, should you need it. Again, you can hover over the bottom and click on the CC button to turn on the subtitles. Finally, you will also notice that there is a separate chat function that will allow you to send messages directly to our staff if you are experiencing technical difficulties. You can chat us there, or you can also email Institute at wustel.edu for support. Uh, so with that, again, I'm Teresa Quo, uh, and I have the privilege of serving as the Gephardt Institute's Assistant Director for Civic Engagement Education. A few years ago, our institute launched our Engaged Democracy Initiative, an initiative comprised of several programs aimed at educating and engaging the campus community in the process of democracy. Though our voter engagement, through our voter engagement work and census work, civic skills workshops and common ground grants to catalyze the campus community across ideological difference. Our aim is to contribute to a campus culture that values active participation toward that more perfect democracy, whether that's in the streets in protest or with their vote in the ballot box. I'm privileged to lead an amazing team of professional staff and students to make this work possible, a team that includes today's moderator. It's now my pleasure to introduce David Blount, who will be in conversation with Congressman Gephardt today. David is our graduate fellow for engaged democracy at the Gephardt Institute and a master of social work candidate at the Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis. Before pursuing his graduate work at WashU, David was a policy researcher in the Income and Benefits Policy Center and Metropolitan Housing and Community, Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute in Washington, DC. That's a mouthful. His areas of research include social mobility of youth and young adults, workforce development, racial equity, and systemic barriers to mobility out of poverty. David has led research examining access to the social safety net, poverty and youth development, food insecurity, and youth-led community change. David is a former Bill Emerson National Hunger Fellow with the Congressional Hunger Center, he also served as a City Year Chicago Corps member as a literacy coach and behavior intervention specialist. Um, and with all of those uh, astounding experiences, I'll also add that David is a budding violinist and makes a mean brownie. Uh, so David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today for an important conversation we'd like to um, invite everyone to around sort of the current affairs of our country, our city, and our world. So um, where, where do we go from here is definitely a question that I'm sure a lot of people have been asking themselves, but in their, in their small groups and communities. Um, and hopefully um, in this conversation, um, you're able to ask our guest here, um, Congressman Gephardt, 
um, some of those questions and getting some insights around um, what your assignment might be, wherever that might be in your life and whatever your time is. So um, I'll introduce our guest. So uh, Dick Gephardt is president and CEO of Gephardt Government Affairs, served for 28 years in the um, U.S. House of Representatives from 1977 to 2005. He represented Missouri's third congressional district, um, including hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. He was uh, elected to serve as House Democratic leader for more than 14 years, as House um, Majority Leader from 1989 to 1995, and Minority Leader from 1995 to 2003. In his role as leader, um, Dick Gephardt emerged as one of the leading strategists for the Democratic Party's platform and chief architect to landmark reforms in healthcare, pensions, education, energy independence, and trade policy. Um, so I'd love to welcome you, Mr. Gephardt, and Dick, uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, David. It's great to be with you, and I want to salute uh, Stephanie and her team uh, for doing such a great job with the Gephardt Institute over these years. Uh, they've really done marvelous work, so it's great to be on this uh, broadcast or event that you're holding. Thank you. Um, so given the sort of the context that we're in, um, we're still in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, you're still figuring out what response, recovery, resilience planning will look like for that. Um, of course, we are in the midst of um, ongoing rekindling of uprisings around calls for racial justice and police reform. We're also in an election year um, that's going to be uh, coming up, and there's a lot of questions around um, what would be the outcomes of that. First question for you is, what are the, with all of that going on, what are the, some of the top three things that are on your mind, given all that's going on right now? Well, I guess if I'm talking about three things, I'd have to say that we face as a country, in my view today, a triple crisis, the likes of which uh, I've never seen in my lifetime, and I think few people, no matter how old they are today, have seen. Uh, I was born in January of 1941, so it was right before World War II broke out. So when I was a youngster, uh, my parents always talked about World War II being <clears throat> the greatest crisis that they had seen in their lives. They were born in the early part of the 1900s. But they also talked about the Great Depression of the 30s as being a seminal event in their lives and in the country. If you think about it, uh, this set of events is a triple crisis. We have the pandemic, which is extraordinary. We've not seen anything like this since 1918 in America. Uh, it is an economic crisis. Uh, I am worried, I think we're all worried that this could be a economic crisis as deep and as bad as what happened in America in the 30s, which was a long-term devastating event in, in almost everybody's life in the country. And then on top of all that, we have this crisis with police and racism and all the issues that flow out of that, which get you to poverty, systemic racism, things that we've been grappling with through the whole history of the country, but have never really fully solved. So as I look at it, I see trip, a triple crisis, triple crises, if that's the way to say it, that really tests the question of whether or not our democracy can survive, given all of that pressure on it. And I am not sure as I sit here today that we will survive. I'm optimistic that we will, basically because I so believe in the American people as citizens and their ability to pilot through all of this at the same time and get to a better place. But let's be clear, this is a really seminal set of events in the history of this country or any country, and the jury is really out on whether democracy can get the job done. I believe it can if we all do our part and do the right things, but it's not for sure at all. 
And you noted history talking about um, actions in the 30s and sort of the concerns of then and the crises that we've seen in our history. Um, given that and your experience as a legislator, what are some um, concerns or lessons or even hopes that you have about what the current um, elected leaders have been, how the current elected leaders have been responding to these three crises so far? Sure. It's a really good question. Um, I've thought a lot about this. Uh, I was the leader of the Democrats in the House of Representatives in 9-11 when we had that set of events, which at the time I thought was the worst thing that I had seen in my career. Uh, as I look back on it, it was not nearly as devastating and difficult as this set of events. As uh, that affected certainly many parts of the country, Washington, New York, 3,000 families who lost family members in the Twin Towers, et cetera. But this affects everybody in the country every day. And it will continue to do that for, for, for a, quite a bit of time as we look out. So I'll just tell you an anecdote. So on uh, the day after, two days after 9-11, uh, George Bush, W. Bush, who was then president, called the four leaders to a meeting in the White House with himself and Vice And he asked everybody for their views on what we should do or what we should be trying to do in this time of crisis. And when I got my chance to talk, I said, Mr. President, the only thing that matters now is that all of us in this room trust one another completely and work together to solve this challenge. Our first responsibility is the safety of the American people. And we must work together every minute of every day to make sure that something like this would never happen again. After that meeting, the president came up to me and hugged me and said, I totally agree with what you're saying and we will do what you've said. We will meet every week at 7 a.m. in the White House and we will work together to solve the problems and then the four of you will work with your colleagues in the Congress to work with us and solve the problems. And that's what we did. We did it for an entire year, every Tuesday morning, 7 a.m. for two hours. So I don't see yet today that kind of collaboration, cooperation, trust, which is at the heart of all human relationships. And I wish I did. However, I do see a, a lot of governors and mayors who are stepping up with their teams and working with their legislatures, their city councils, their state legislatures, and they are having those kinds of meetings. And they are developing trust and they are working together uh, to solve the problems. The other thing that I think leaders have to do in a crisis like this is be honest with the people. Tell them the truth as best you can figure it out. Nobody knows the absolute truth ever, but you can do your best to give as much honest, truthful, factual information as you can. Because in a democracy, the people have to conduct themselves to solve the problems. And if they don't have a common set of facts to deal with, it's very hard for them to do what needs to be done. So I, I'm a little chagrin that not enough of that is happening, but I hope more of it will. And, and, and I really trust the American people. I think if you give them a chance, you give them the facts, they rise to the occasion. And they're doing that all over the country. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, especially as we're, the sort of the issues we face around the millions of lost jobs, the millions of people who are still unemployed, um, a lot of people have lost trust in the res through this response um, and a lot of the struggle and hurt that has come from the pandemic. But 
um, also not being able to see the resources and support that they feel their communities need. What do you think needs to happen for a lot of communities, especially um, communities of color who have been disproportionately impacted by this to really regain trust in leadership in these institutions um, that we hope that we'll be able to answer the call when needed? Another great question. I, I think um, what the Congress has so far done with the president on the economic front is not nearly enough. This is a long-term devastating economic event. There are a lot of Americans today who are about to go off whatever aid the government gave out in the last three months. Uh, if, when, that, when and if that happens, they're not gonna be able to pay their bills. They're not gonna be able to pay their mortgage. They're not gonna be able to buy food. They're not gonna be able to support their families. That's devastating. By the same token, there are a lot of small and medium-sized businesses and some large ones in Sicily that aren't gonna be able to stay in business. You're gonna see massive business failures, I'm worried, across small and medium-sized and even some large businesses. Uh, so I think it's imperative you know, the Congress has passed like $3 trillion of aid. I really believe they're gonna have to put out another two or $3 trillion. And I hope it's to help individuals and businesses stay alive till we get out of this pandemic. You got 20% unemployment. Uh, how do we expect people to survive? And so that to me is the main thing that needs to be done. In addition, the federal government should be sending money to states and local governments. Many things they've had to do and have to do in the future to deal with these triple crises. I know it's a tall order. Uh, it, Congress has trouble passing big bills like that that have huge amounts of money that nobody's ever thought about in the past. I remember when I worked on budgets, it was a fraction of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. This is the time for the government to be, to step up and be the backstop for this economy. If we don't do it, you're gonna lose the infrastructure of our economy, which is businesses and individuals, uh, and then you're really in free fall. So that's my hope that we can restore people's faith and trust in these institutions that are supposed to be the backstop. And sort of sticking with potential solutions, we're also in a time where there are a lot of demands being made to think about police accountability, reforming policing in different communities, especially in black communities. Um, what, what are sort of your reflections on um, the demands around police reform, also the defund police movement, and what solutions are there to make sure that police violence is, so it comes to an end for communities of color? Let me first say that uh, the events of really the last 10 years, but kind of culminating in what happened with George Floyd, which was horrific, has really awakened everybody, not just African Americans and other minorities, but the entire white community to the problems that we still have and have had uh, with giving people equal justice and equal opportunity. We have failed on both fronts. Now that doesn't mean that we haven't made progress. We all remember the civil rights uh, uh, activities of the 1960s where we had violence and a lot of the things that you're seeing today, people marching in the streets, there was progress made from that, no doubt about it. But I think a lot of people thought, well, that we solved the problem. We're okay. There is equal justice. There is equal opportunity in the United States. Well, there's not. There never was. We made progress, but we never reached the goal line. We aren't even close to the goal line. And so 
if I'm optimistic, and I always am, I see what's been happening as an opportunity for all of us to address these issues in a more organized and effective way so that we really begin to make a big leap in progress on all of that. Mm -hmm. now, yeah, what would be your challenge? Police, police forces. I, I, I don't think that's the right way to talk about it, but we do need, we need more public funds in creating more competent police forces and police people, police officers. Part of the problem is, you know, we don't pay policemen enough, in my view. We don't pay teachers enough, in my view. There's a great public good that comes from getting good people who have good training and education and background to take these vital, important jobs for the future of our communities and our country. Uh, I remember back in the 90s, we passed a big crime bill in Congress and Bill Clinton signed it. It had some good things in it and some bad things in it. But one of the good things it has was a lot of money for local police forces to do community policing, police on the street constantly, getting to know the people in the community, to trust the people, and for the people to trust them. Since then, we've gone to militarizing the police forces, which I think is not a great idea. That, that's saying to the public, you know, you're the enemy. Well, they're not the enemy. You got to get their help in keeping peace and order in any community. They're the best uh, ally you have in doing that. Now, in addition to all that, we need to do a better job, a much better job of K through 12 education, of, of training of people, even people that didn't get a high school diploma, and then connecting those people with jobs in the community. In St. Louis, I've been helping uh, some great people we have in the community uh, who've been doing this much longer than I have and, and know more, a lot more about it, about how we can increase uh, efforts at training, real training, and then connecting young people in the minority and, and in the women community into jobs with companies in St. Louis. So all those things, all that work has to go on at a much greater pace. The good news is I think this crisis uh, and the demonstrations really make all of us much more sensitive to these issues and much more anxious and enthusiastic about doing the hard things that have to be done to make real progress. And I think in many of the demands that have come out, uh, you know, I definitely appreciate the point on community policing, the idea of what does it mean to look at police training to reduce um, violent action when it's not necessary. Um, also in thinking about the defund police movement, also reinvesting in public assets such as public education. Right. I'm wondering also, what is it, police accountability look like, um, knowing that um, over these last few cases, and of course upcoming cases, people have concerns about, no, the violence has never been held accountable. So what does it mean for people to have trust that the system will hold folks accountable when violence is done in, in an unjust way? Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, what's happening is really needed to happen a long time ago, and that is police have to be accountable. This is a tough job. We all know that uh, it is a very sensitive job, but what has happened in a, a number of these cases is just unacceptable behavior. And you have to sanction unacceptable behavior. And so we've had laws on the books that say that police are immune from any kind of uh, criminal charges or civil suits and so on and so forth. I think that's 
going away. I think that part of this movement will be to review all those laws and policies and, and to put it into a better outcome. That has to happen. If police feel they can do anything they want, even if it's unacceptable behavior, then you're gonna get more of it. So I think this is a needed reform. And again, sometimes crisis causes change faster. And that's, I think, happening now. I know a lot of people have made comments and I've been in conversation where um, people have felt that these times were reminisced back on 2014 in Ferguson with the, with the killing of Michael Brown and the start of sort of a rekindling of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, why do you think it's taken so long? Like you said, it, it sometimes takes a crisis to move things forward. Why do you think it takes so long for people to even just say Black Lives Matter? And what do you, does Black Lives Matter mean to you? Well, I'll say it again, equal justice, equal opportunity for everyone. And we have failed, look, the, the major sin of our country is slavery and racial injustice. And we all, all of us, whoever we are, have to rethink and relearn all of this. And, and so this crisis forces that rethinking on everybody in the country. I mean, all of us are a product of where we grew up, where we came from, the environment we grew up in. For white people like me, you don't think every day about what it would be like to have, to be in the shoes of an African American who grew up in St. Louis or wherever. What would that be like? What do you face? What are the challenges and barriers you face because the color of your skin is different? So having that rethinking process go on, which I believe it is, it's going on much faster than it ever would. Ferguson, I think, you know, made a lot of people in St. Louis and the St. Louis area kind of wake up to these issues. But now this is national. And I don't remember all the facts on the Ferguson, uh, Michael Brown situation, but I don't know that we had videotape. And I must tell you that the videotape in these most recent cases have had a big impact. I mean, it's really made people sit up and think, I mean, my God, what, what is happening? If you don't see it, you don't see it. So this is a very, very different time than that. Progress was made in Ferguson. There was commissions set up and groups of citizens got together. I, I think we made some progress after Ferguson, but not enough. As I said, these issues are bigger than just what happens with the police. It's systemic racism. It's uh, equal opportunity, equal justice. It's, it all fits together. And we just haven't made enough progress uh, in, in Ferguson or in anywhere else that we need to make. And hopefully now this burst of effort will come out of this huge change that's required after what we're involved in. And I think especially as um, we think about multiple three crises, thinking about um, the pandemic and public health issues, thinking about the economic issues, and of course, thinking about racial equity. Um, what types of um, lessons do you think we can um, gra grasp from the organizers out there who are currently trying to build solutions for re recovery and resilience planning to this pandemic, but also to sort of racial violence? Well, there's never been a more important time for civic engagement by everybody than now. Uh, you know, Stephanie said when we started the Gephardt Institute, we had 
no inkling of where we might be uh, 15 years later. Uh, civic engagement's always been important. Having citizens in a democracy, always important. But now it is the name of the game. And everybody, and I want to underline, everybody can do something. Everybody can't run for office or doesn't want to. Everybody can't be a community organizer or doesn't want to. Everybody can't be a mentor to a young person who needs help. But all of those things can be done. People can join community organizations. People can go out and march. People can be part of the protest. People can uh, help figure out how do we get more people to vote. People can figure out how do we uh, support candidates that are for doing the right things on these issues and who they know as a human being and they know they will do the right things. Mm -hmm. Unlimited opportunity to address all of this by all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope will happen everywhere in the country, in every community. And I think you're seeing a lot of it. I, I'm really encouraged. Is it all going to end up in the right place? I don't know. But I, all I know is you can't change something without trying. And that's what I think is happening and what I hope will continue to happen. Great. I'm going to transition to the Q&A. I'm going to remind everybody to do your upvotes on the questions that you think um, really align with what you'd like to hear. Um, I see a few already. Um, we'll start with one. Sort of going back to what you were talking about with um, going out to vote and helping people get registered to vote. Um, uh, do you think that voting rights are going to be compromised this November, given sort of scenario with potential second spike, given the fiascos that happened in Wisconsin and Georgia in the last go around? I'm very worried about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw today that the Justice Department is filing lawsuits uh, in, against states and local governments, I guess, that want to do mail-in voting. And the argument of the Justice Department, and I take it President Trump, is that uh, this will be a wholesale fraud go on uh, around the country. If they win those lawsuits, uh, then I'm really worried uh, that we can have a competent election. Uh, because there, there, for understandable reasons, there will be thousands and perhaps millions of people that don't want to go out to a polling place per, in person to cast their vote because they'll be worried about the virus. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And so it, it, it's unimaginable to me that the president and the DOJ should be filing lawsuits to stop an activity that has gone on for a long time in our country without fraud and without problems, which is mail-in voting. So if those lawsuits succeed, I, I don't have a good answer for you on whether or not we're gonna have a competent election. And if you can't have an election, a competent election in a democracy like ours, you lose the democracy. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important issue, and we should all follow it. Uh, <laughs> I got to tell you, if they get rid of mail-in voting, I'm going to hit the bricks. That's all I can tell you. And when it comes to mail-in voting and um, other sort of issues of mail voter suppression, what are some um, hopeful solutions or at least actions that you think people can take to really um, address that now before getting into sort of a crisis moment later in the fall? Well, uh, I, I got two thoughts, one for the future and one for right now. For the future, I have believed for a long time that the federal government, and I think it, it could do that legally, the federal government should take over the election process for federal officials, the president, members of Congress. 
these are federal officials. They're not officials of the state of Missouri or wherever. And the federal government should step up to fund those elections uh, so they're competently done. It's very complicated today to run a good election. In the old days, you know, you'd get retirees to come in to be election workers. It was something for them to do. They made a little money, but the voting was pretty straightforward. It was a ballot, a paper ballot, and people filled it out. There were some problems, but it was pretty simple and understandable. Now you've got mail voting. Uh, someday, I hope we can have internet voting. I don't, I don't, I've talked to a lot of people about it who are experts in security and the internet. They all believe it can be done, but getting the right equipment and training the people to deal with the equipment is a big deal and it's expensive. If you just leave this to the states without the adequate amount of money, it's never going to really be done right. And, and there's nothing more important in a democracy than running a competent election. It should be everybody's wish. And so either by taking over the federal part of it to the federal government or more preferably giving the right amount of money to the states so they can run competent election and they have the right people who know how to do it and can do it effectively and the right equipment is critical to the future of the country. Thank you for that. And this next question is sort of going back to your note about um, people being able to go back out and feel safe, um, being able to participate. One thing is masks have become more of a politicized thing. And how can we convince public that wearing a mask is not a political issue? Um, and as people think about going back to school in the fall in K-12, People think about standing in line to vote or even just everyday function. Well, what's your what's your reflection on how do we convince people that wearing a mask is more about our public health and, and, and keeping each other safe than it is a political issue? Well, David, you've really touched on a, a hot button problem that we have that, that affects the mask issue, but a lot of other things. I have never seen, and most people have never seen this country as polarized as it is today. It's you're on team A or you're on team B, but you can't be on both. And I, I must tell you, I don't see how you have a democracy where team A hates team B and vice versa. It doesn't work. Democracy requires respect, cooperation, and collaboration between all of our people. And if this polarization continues, we are doomed as a democracy. Abraham Lincoln said it in 1858, a house divided against itself cannot stand. United we stand, divided we fall. Unfortunately, we have some foreign adversaries and, and others who really want us to be divided, to defeat us. I, I must say that if we allow that to happen to ourselves and modern technology and communications technology is part of the problem and we've got to solve those problems as best we can. But there are a lot of forces, political forces, foreign forces that want us to be divided to defeat us and to end our democracy. And if you look around the world, there are a lot of former democracies that are fading away because of polarization and division, hatred, distrust, disrespect, that cannot go on. And if we keep it going on, we're in big trouble. 
And so I'm, I'm hearing that we probably need to go through a process of healing and um, as, especially in those three crises where there needs to be a process for healing after this pandemic and as we sort of reach normalcy. But even when we talk about systemic racism, it was a do racial healing in that way too. What does healing look like so we can sort of bridge some of these divides um, and start making decisions together instead of only being in certain camps? Well, first of all, we need our leaders, whether it's at the federal, state, or local level, to be exhibiting the behavior of respect and collaboration and cooperation and building toward trust. People take cues from their leaders. They should. Uh, and, and so leadership at all levels, in all communities, is vital right now. Second, we've got to see, people want to see some tangible progress on some of these problems. Right now, we're having a spike in pandemic cases. Uh, that will that will destroy people's trust that we're making progress. So in state and local communities, they need to retrench and figure out how do we keep people safe? How do we convince people that common sense things like wearing masks, uh, not going into big crowds, uh, uh, not breathing on people, coughing on people is, is something we all can do. Uh, all of this is inconvenient. Nobody wants to do any of these things. It is what it is. These are the facts. We've got to deal with reality. And if we do that and everybody does their part, we'll be okay and we'll make progress and people will gain confidence on the racial issues. Uh, we've got to show progress. Police departments need to be reformed and and improved in, in their personnel and their training and their rules and regulations and their results. Um, and, and, and we've got to make progress on education and training and, and dealing with the root causes of poverty, which is rampant and even more rampant than it was before the pandemic in many parts of the country. You know, you, you gotta show people that we got our act together and we're making progress. And all of us can be part of helping to make that progress in our communities. Yeah, I, I think one of the things too that's coming up in the questions as well is um, what does success look like? And then when we talk about success, what are the facts? And I think um, as someone says, we, we currently have a president who might construe those facts or the facts will get lost based on some of the rhetoric that comes out of the current administration um, or other leadership um, on in one side of the aisle or both sides of the aisle. What, what's your suggestions on how to break through some of that noise or at least get back to facts and get back to really getting a vision for success we all can trust and agree on? Well, we're all citizens and we have a responsibility to try to learn the facts as best we can and to, to not pay attention to obvious untruths and to disinformation and misinformation. Um, I'm gonna say something here, I'm not sure I'm right, but I think Twitter, uh, and incidentally, Jack Dorsey was founded by a St. Louis, and Jack is, grew up in the neighborhood right next to where I grew up. Uh, they have been doing a lot more to take disinformation and misinformation and hate information and, off of their Twitter sites. Uh, Facebook has not. Uh, I think that's deplorable. I mean, these platforms, which make billions of dollars, have a responsibility, whether they like it or not, whether they know it or not, to try to edit the information to some extent so that people can have a better chance of figuring out what's more or less true and what's a lot less true. Mm -hmm. And you can't have a democracy if you don't have any shared set of facts because this is government of, by, and for the people. It's 
of the people. The people have to run the bus. And if they don't have any shared information at all, and they're in two polarized camps that live in two alternative realities, we're done. So we all have a responsibility, but some of these important platforms have a responsibility as well. So sort of going into our closing question, um, which based on sort of some of those points that you just made around everyone having a role, but also trying to pinpoint the facts and the information we all need to be informed participants in our democracy. Um, what's your assignment for the young person who wants to pursue a career in public service for our current leadership who is making decisions in this times of crisis, um, or just for the everyday person who's going to work each day. What's, what's their assignment to really be part of the, this movement and to see progress in the way that you see, so you see is needed? I guess I'd go back to my uh, early days. Uh, when I was in college, uh, I, Jack Kennedy was president and I was really impressed by him. I thought, boy, if somebody that smart with that background could give his life to politics and public service, that would be something really good to do. And so when I graduated from law school, I came back to the neighborhood I'd grown up in in St. Louis. And uh, I just decided I, I wanted to get involved. I didn't know how to do it. Um, I was a Democrat, so I asked some people in the neighborhood, "How do? You, where's the Democratic organization around here? And they said, well, it's the 14th Ward Democratic Organization. And I found out they met on, you know, the first Tuesday of every month or something. And so I just showed up at the, at the meeting, walked in, and I didn't know anybody. They didn't know me. I went up to the committeeman and I said, uh, I'm, I live here and uh, I'm, I just got out of college and I want to volunteer. I want to be part of this organization and I'd love to do anything you tell me to do. And he kind of looked at me like I was nuts. And, and then he said, okay, you can be a volunteer precinct captain and that I'll give you the second precinct. And I said, well, what do I need to do? And he said, you need to go door to door and meet everybody in the precinct, introduce yourself, Find out who you think is a Democrat, who's a Republican. And then on election day, you go stand at the polling place and we'll give you the ballot, the paper ballot to hand out, suggested ballot. And you hand it out to all the people that come in. And then at four o'clock, if anybody who you identified as a Democrat is not showing up, you get in your car and you go out and bring them in to vote. I did that for 10 years. Everybody can do something. You don't have to do politics. You can join a community organization that's trying to improve your community. You can join organizations like Big Brothers and Sisters that, that try to mentor and help young people that have big challenges. You can mentor one child somewhere. Uh, you can give money to good organizations that are doing good things in your community. You can volunteer time with those organizations. I saw a thing on TV the other day where high school kids had volunteered to deliver meals to frontline health workers who needed meals delivered and to senior citizens in nursing homes who needed meals delivered. All of us can do something and, and you just need to look around and Figure out what's interesting to you, what you think you can do, what you're capable of, and just do it. It's the old Nike ad, just do it. Um, thank you again, and thank you everyone for tuning in and also sending some, some amazing questions, and I wish we could get to more of them. Um, but thank you, um, thank you for all your in insights and, and perspective and stories. Um, and helping us build a narrative around what moving forward looks like, um, given these three crises you introduced and some of the solutions you see going forward. So thank you again. Um, uh, thank on. you, David.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. You did a great job. It's great to be with you always. And uh, keep up your good work. And Stephanie and the whole team, thank you for doing this. Keep up your great work. And uh, let's all be optimistic that we're going to make big progress. Big change, big progress. Don't let any crisis go to waste. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dick, and thank you, David. Let's be optimistic, big change, big progress, perfect way to sum it up. If we were together in person, I know we'd hear loud applause for both of you in gratitude for your insights and your leadership. I'd like to take just a moment before we wrap to recognize our team at the Gephardt Institute that has made this event possible. Shruti Desai managed our technology, Jen Thomas marketed this event and brought us together. Teresa Kuo led the vision for this conversation, and Colleen Waterman does the noble work of fundraising for the Gephardt Institute to assure that Dick Gephardt's legacy and vision for civic engagement endures. And I know she'd be happy to connect with any of you who would like to support our work. And finally, I invite you to stay connected with us, whether virtually or on campus this fall. Momentarily, you'll see an invitation to complete a brief survey to give us feedback on this event and share your ideas for future events like it. This will also include an opportunity to sign up for one of our email newsletters to stay connected and informed about our work. Thank you once again for joining in this conversation, for the great questions that came forward, and for your commitment to civic engagement during this pivotal time in our nation's history.